Grazie Chris per l'interessante relazione. Passiamo al secondo speaker, James Binion, titolare della James Binion in Metal Art in Bellingham, Washington, USA. James Binion è un produttore di gioielleria ed è riconosciuto internazionalmente come uno dei grandi esperti della tecnica giapponese Mokume-Gane, penso di averlo pronunciato bene. Una particolare tipologia di placatura costituita da strati di metallo di diversi colori. Tiene corsi di formazione sulla pratica della produzione di gioielleria ed è autore di molti articoli tecnici. Ha ricevuto riconos numerosi riconoscimenti per i suoi molti contributi e per le sue memorie presso il Santa Fe Symposium di Albuquerque, New Mexico. Il titolo della sua relazione è un nuovo metodo per preparare modelli 3D in fotopolimero acrilico per la microfusione. La difficoltà di ottenere oggetti microfusi di buona qualità partendo da resine 3D è ben nota e la proliferazione di stampanti 3D nell'industria della gioielleria ha acuito ulteriormente la complessità del problema. La memoria presenta i passaggi di processo per indurire e preparare fotopolimeri acrilici stampati in 3D per microfusione, riducendo fortemente i problemi durante la cottura del gesso e portando a migliore qualità superficiale dopo colata. Prego, James. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here to uh, speak on this topic. Um, as uh, he just mentioned, I work mostly in a uh, Japanese metalworking technique called mokume gane, uh, so that has nothing to do with what I'm speaking about today. What I also uh, do some work in is lost wax casting. And the uh, 3D photopolymers and the 3D printing has become uh, widespread in the industry. And If you listen to the manufacturers of these machines and the resins, they will tell you that you can print beautiful patterns and you can cast them directly and they'll work wonderfully. That has not been my experience and it's not been the experience of a lot of people that I know who have been working with it. So I got interested in why that we're getting bad castings and this paper is a result of uh, the research that I've done in trying to figure out why it's not working well, and what can we do to fix that problem. So 3D printing uh, is a relatively new process in jewelry, but it was originally uh, patented uh, back in 1985. And these are a couple of drawings from the original US patents for 3D printing machines that use a photopolymer resin and either a laser or some kind of uh, transmission light mask to allow you to create images that are grown or built in individual slices and layers to create a complete 3D model that you can then do something with uh, from this CAD file. So what are the photopolymers? Um, most plastics can be configured to make a photopolymer resin. So you have the plastic resin and then you uh, So an acrylic, epoxy, urethane, a vinyl, or a styrene. And then it's set up to catalyze or to go from a liquid to a solid with a uh, photoreactive element uh, or photo initiator. So in this, screen, in this slide, you can see uh, the, the monomer, which is the resin, uh, an oligomer, which is a larger molecule, but again, still a resin, and then the photo initiator. You hit it with UV light and it all links up and forms a solid. So this is a short animation on what's going on. Uh, this is uh, methyl methacrylate, which is basically your standard acrylic, clear acrylic resin like plexiglass. And this is one of the first uh, photopolymers. So the photo initiator is struck by a beam of UV light. It splits into a free radical which then causes the element to change shape and be able to link up with additional molecules, forming a long chain of molecules. So it goes from being a monomer to a polymer. So a single molecule to many molecules that are all 
chained together. And so when we talk about polymers, this is what they are. They're a whole bunch of individual molecules that have been strung together in a chain. As it's strung together, the viscosity of the liquid increases and eventually it becomes totally solid. So at some point in this process, you're going to uh, quit polymerizing. You will either have two polymer chains that join together. So here we have a photo initiator on each end and the two chains have joined together. It'll contact a molecule that actually binds onto the end of the chain and stops the polymerization, like oxygen uh, stops the polymerization from occurring. Or it'll just run out of room in the trans transition from s liquid to solid. Eventually, it will not be able to connect to additional monomer, so you'll have a chain that's unterminated. So it's sitting there waiting to connect to something, but there's no way for it to move around and connect to another molecule. And you also end up with a bunch of stray monomer in the resulting polymer that has not been cured or not been connected into a molecular chain and some extra photo initiator. This is an example of a resin that is used. Uh, it was published as a open source resin this is not a castable resin, but this gives you an idea of the composition of these photopolymer resins. Uh, about 40% of it is monomer. Then another 40% is oligomer, so a larger molecule. Then they add a reactive dilutant that allows it to be more fluid while it's in the bed of the printer uh, because the monomers and oligomers tend to be too thick, too viscous, and then you wouldn't be able to print with them, so they add the dilutant so that it's fluid enough to move around in the tray. And the photo initiator, and then there's a, another substance added, a UV blocker. And that's a very important thing because you want to control how deep the UV light penetrates into the resin. Otherwise, you'd hit the resin with a UV light and you'd cure all the way up through the top of the chamber. So the UV blocker limits how far the light can go in the resin. And so this is what gives you your layer thickness of 20 microns or 40 microns or whatever that layer thickness is, is how much UV blocker they put into the resin. And in most of the ones that we're using for direct casting, there is also a uh, pigment. They're not clear. This is a clear resin. Most of them have a, a red or an orange or blue pigment that's added that also acts as a UV blocking agent. So we're able to go from a CAD model to an actual printed part that has a great fidelity for uh, reproduction of our CAD model into this printed part. And that's great, except when we go to and try and cast them, sometimes we don't get really good results. So I'm going to try and uh, explain what I've come to believe are the problems with these uh, curing and, and casting these models. So the very first thing that we need to remember, this isn't wax. You'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, it's a wax, or treat it like a wax. This isn't a wax. It doesn't break down like a wax. It, it's very different in how it works when we heat it up inside of the investment. So as you begin to heat it, it doesn't melt. It literally begins to come apart. The chains, those photopolymer chains, break as they're heated up, and they form new elements. Sometimes it goes back to the monomer. Sometimes it uh, breaks down into other compounds. But this breakdown doesn't begin until you hit 300 degrees centigrade. And it happens in the 300 to 400 degrees centigrade range. So as I said, they fraction into shorter sections. Um, they can also uh, turn back into a monomer. And actually, they can cycle between monomer and polymer for a little while as they're being uh, broken down and brought back into uh, chains uh, during the heating process. Eventually, they continue to decompose, and they break down into a mix of lighter molecules like acetone, formaldehyde, methane, methanol, and finally, uh, they're oxidized uh, in the heating process and turn into 
water vapor, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. And those eventually go out of the uh, kiln in the burnout process. So with a lot of luck, most of the photopolymer mass decomposes into vapors and gases and goes away. But a certain portion of it turns into a tar-like substance during this breakdown. And that will eventually burn away, but it can leave large chunks of carbon or char in the um, cavity that you've uh, created in the investment. And these can end up as inclusions in the uh, casting process if you don't get rid of the char by burning it out long enough. So just a, a quick graph of uh, adding heat to the polymer, and you can get molymer lighter molecules, gas and vapor, tar, and then eventually char. Another problem with these patterns is that they have a very high thermal expansion, much higher than uh, wax, and because they don't break down at low temperature, the uh, expansion puts a tremendous amount of strain on the investment. And this can cause cracking and degradation of the mold surface in the casting uh, process. So we've often seen, if, you put, if you've done any work with these, if you put too many photopolymer patterns in a casting flask, you'll end up with a casting that has a lot of fins or even totally fails because the photopolymers have expanded so much that they break the investment and fracture it. So to combat the thermal expansion process, uh, it's imperative to take the proper steps in preparing your investment. You need a very strong investment to make this work well. Uh, you, it's almost imperative to use uh, additives to the investment, uh, boric acid, calcium nitrate, to strengthen the investment. Um, there are some investments that are commercially uh, fabricated with these additions, but Sometimes you can add additional uh, boric acid and calcium nitrate for stronger investment. When you invest, it's absolutely critical to leave it alone for at least two hours during uh, the setting time. If you move the flask around too much, it's going to fracture microscopically inside of the uh, curing gypsum. And when the thermal expansion of the resin starts, it's going to break those fractures even uh, larger. And then you're going to need a modified burnout to get rid of this uh, excessive char. And you're probably going to need to change the ramping on the burnout to, uh, again, reduce the amount of uh, strain during the uh, initial stages of the burnout. It's also possible to use a high-speed dental investment. This works really well, but it's expensive. And it's very hard to remove from the cast product. So it's not widely used except for uh, something where you can get a high value for your uh, part because it is expensive investment to use. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, at the end result, we've got this, uh, these little particles of uh, solid carbon. And if we don't get rid of it when you do your casting, you're going to end up with a lot of little pinpoint porosity in the piece that is where this carbon was in place and the metal couldn't displace it, and you end up with these little pits all over the surface of the uh, cast piece. So it's important to have your high temperature section of your burnout long enough to get rid of all the char that's created during the decomposition of the acrylic resin. So this is an example of uh, what you don't want to see when you uh, finally break the piece out and take a look at it. And you know your model didn't look like this when you put it into the flask, so why does it look like this when you've cast it and taken it out? Well, some of this is char, and some of this is a, a few other things that are going on. The resin wasn't fully cured when you invested it, and because it was not fully cured, you've got some additional chemical reactions going on during the uh, investing and burnout process that are degrading the surface of the investment. So when we're printing these models, each model is made up of little bitty tiny uh, voxels or uh, elements 
where the laser or the mask has allowed a small volume of resin to be cured. And ideally, we would like to see those as nice cubic voxels. And they would build up into larger uh, parts of the piece. Unfortunately, they don't cure as nice little cubes. They cure as a uh, slightly uh, pyramid structure. So when you start grouping them together, instead of getting a nice large form like this, you end up with something that looks more like this. And you'll notice that there are a lot of voids or empty space in this array. And those aren't actually empty. Those are full of uncured resin. So looking at a slice through that uh, array, you can see that these uh, purple areas are where the resin is trapped, it's not cured, and it's sitting there in your model when you're getting ready to uh, process it further. So after you take it out of the machine, most of the machine manufacturers uh, suggest that you rinse it with uh, isopropyl alcohol to remove excess surface resin. And then you put it into a ultraviolet curing chamber to supposedly finish curing the model. And uh, then you trim, tree, invest, and burn out, and you're good to go. Um, well, sometimes. So these nice patterns, are they ready to cast? Well, ideally, uh, if you took a section through a ring, you would see that it's cured all the way through. So this green section here is indicating where the model would be cured all the way through. But the reality is you've got a section inside of there. The thicker the section, the more likely you are to have large volumes of uncured resin. And uh, as an exhibit of this, um, I accidentally left a cup of uncured resin sitting out in my shop. And I went back to it a month later. And I thought, oh, it'll be totally cured, you know, because it's been sitting out in the light and UV light's going to cause it to cure. I picked it up, and it's still liquid inside. Yes, it's cured on the top. This particular cup has been sitting around for three years now. It's got a two millimeter layer on the surface that's cured, and the rest of the volume is totally uncured. Now, the plastic cup has a UV inhibitor in it, so the, the sides of it are not being affected by UV light because the cup itself is stopping it. But the top surface that was open and exposed to sunlight, two millimeters, that's it. It stops. So the UV inhibitor in the resin works really well, and, but unfortunately it causes us uh, some problems because there's a lot of resin that is not cured in our models. So why do the uncured resins cause casting problems? Um, I have to freely admit here that this is a hypothesis. I don't have any scientific basis to uh, back up my hypothesis. But acrylic photopolymers, one of the largest uses for acrylic resins is as a glue. It's used in all kinds of uh, glues. There are all kinds of uh, photoreactive glues. Your dentist uses it to work on your teeth. He glues in crowns. Uh, that's all acrylic photopolymers. And you know they put that little light in your mouth to cure the resin. It's the same stuff that, that we're using to make these models. So what happens? Well, we put this semi-cured model into our investment, which is water and gypsum powder and some quartz. That resin is miscible in water. It will not necessarily dissolve in water, but it is easily distributed in water. So when you pump this thing back and forth by putting a vacuum on it, releasing the vacuum, putting a vacuum on it again, it pulls the uncured resin out of the model and it now is starting to propagate around the edges and the surface of the model. So as you begin to heat it, 
that resin begins to cure. And it's glued, it's literally glued itself to the surface of your investment. And as you start going through all the thermal uh, expansion and eventually contraction as the model is decomposing, it's literally ripping chunks off of the surface of the model. And this is why the surface of your model, once it's cast, ends up looking like cottage cheese. It's because all of these little chunks have been pulled out of the surface of the uh, investment cavity. So when we have a large amount of uncured resin, in, as in a, uh, a model like this, and this one was um, treated only with UV light uh, to do uh, curing after growing the model. So cured it according to the manufacturer's instructions, cast it, and you can see the surface looks horrible. There's no way that you could sell this to anybody. So how do we fix it? Uh, they've seen a lot of different ways that people suggest. Um, there are uh, people who say, oh, you spray it with a, uh, an acrylic spray or you dip it in a, a, another solution that forms a shell that acts as a, uh, an insulating layer between the model and the uh, investment. And sometimes those work, sometimes they don't. Uh, it's very dependent on the model geometry and a lot of other things. Uh, but one of the processes that's, uh, that showed the most uh, good results was to heat the model after growing it. And in that heating process, it cures more of the resin than uh, just using the UV. And so when I first started looking at this, I, I started exploring uh, these uh, Temperatures of around two to three hundred degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry. Oh, there it is. Uh, Ninety-three to uh, 176 degrees centigrade uh, to cure the model, and with with some better results than just using UV, but there were some problems uh, associated with that. So I started looking uh, a little deeper uh, and trying to figure out a way to get a little bit better uh, result with the casting. But as you can see, uh, the heat-treated model is a lot better than that one that was done just with UV. And uh, all of these photos are from models that were grown at the same time on the printer. So these are all treated differently after growing, but they were all grown at the same time on the printer, and they were all cast in the same flask. But one of the things that you begin to notice uh, with the heat treating is that uh, you start losing edge definition. So even if you get a good surface out of it, the sharp edges of your letters and things like that start to develop rounded surfaces. And in some cases, on finer pieces, you'll actually see the model shift its geometry as the strain in the model is reduced by heating. It's annealing, just like annealing metal. And so you can lose the geometry that you had when it came off of the printer. So there are some problems with using heat. So how do we improve on the heat treatment? So the initial idea was that the heat caused greater motion at the molecular level in the model. It allowed more of the uncured monomer to link up into existing polymer chains. Um, as I started to look into this, um, I started weighing my models before treatment and after treatment. And I started noticing that I was losing 2 to 3% of the model weight when I would heat treat them. So that tells me that the resin is going away somewhere. It's not just changing the uh, resin from an uncured to a cured state, but it's actually evaporating during the heating process. So I started thinking, well, is there a way to uh, increase the amount of uh, evaporation? And the thought that initially came up was, if you put it in a vacuum and you heat it up, you're not only going to have the heat, but you're going to use the vacuum to evaporate more of the resin. So in my studio, I actually happen to have a vacuum oven. Um, I'm a little bit of a mad scientist, so I have a lot of equipment that is not normal uh, jewelry studio equipment. 
and I uh, put this in the vacuum oven, and I heat treated it, and I evacuated the air, and I got some very good results. So here's a, here's a vacuum oven. It's just a chamber that uh, you can pull a vacuum on. Uh, it's a metal chamber. You heat the outside of the metal chamber to put heat into the uh, process. You can see here, this is a picture through the glass door of the vacuum chamber, uh, the models being heated up, and uh, a shot of the pressure gauge showing the pressure inside the vacuum chamber. And one of the things I noticed as I was using this to process the models is that I was getting hard to see through that glass door after doing many uh, models through the uh, chamber. And I realized that the resin was actually condensing on the surface of that glass door. So that's showing you it's leaving the model and it's actually condensing on the coldest area in the vacuum oven. And take a razor blade and you can scrape it off, but it's, it's condensing and curing on that surface uh, during the process. So here's an example of what a heat and vacuum treated model looks like. Um, I feel like the models that I'm getting now are probably as good as wax. They're definitely printing, they're uh, casting to the level of detail that they're printed at. So you still have build lines, you still have the defects that are coming from the 3D printing process itself, but I'm getting really good surface and much sharper detail. I'm not losing uh, the sharpness of the edges of the piece. <coughs> so for the cat, <coughs> excuse me, for the casting test that I did for this uh, paper, I uh, used the gypsum bonded investment. I uh, used a standard industry gypsum bonded investment <clears> that was designed for plastic patterns. I did not add anything extra to it, and I used um, this burnout schedule that's given here. Thank you very much. So all the pictures of uh, cast product in this presentation are done on this burnout schedule. I've since moved on to some other uh, schedules that I think are better, but just for the state, sake of argument, this was a um, burnout schedule that was presented in another Santa Fe Symposium paper that uh, they had good results with. So I copied their schedule for this uh, experiment. So I grew a whole series of patterns simultaneously, and then I would treat one with heat, one with UV, and one with the vacuum heat treating process. So here's some examples of what the surfaces look like in approximately the same areas on the piece. And if you notice, uh, looking at the difference between the heat treated and the vacuum heat treated, the heat treating, uh, heat treated ones also show a slightly rougher surface than the vacuum heat treated. So uh, I'm not quite sure why that is, but it is something that I noticed in uh, looking at the pieces. Here's a look at the underside. Uh, the UV one is just absolutely horrible. <laughs> it's amazing how bad that one is. Uh, the heat treated one's not bad. Uh, certainly it was something that you could clean up and, and make an acceptable print out of uh, or model out of. And the vacuum heat treated is actually very good. Uh, just a couple of areas with minor defects. So my conclusions from this set of experiments were that the uncured resin remaining in the photopolymer patterns when invested in cast creates significant damage to the mold face resulting in defective castings that UV exposure is a method for post grow curing of photopolymer patterns is often ineffective, um, mostly because it just doesn't penetrate deeply enough into the model because of the UV inhibitor and the pigment that are in the photopolymers that are used in the machine. 
Heating as a method of curing the photopolymer patterns provides a significant improvement over the UV, but the surface quality uh, is not quite as good as I would like to have. That using a vacuum oven heat treatment uh, process uh, is going to give you a, uh, a better pattern, um, higher quality casting, retaining more detail, and while I haven't tested this against every resin out there from every machine, there, there are hundreds of them now. There's no way that I, as an individual, could test all of them. But I have pe people send me resins, send me cast pieces or uh, grown pieces and, and have me test them. And I'm, I almost always see an improvement in using the vacuum heat treatment method over the UV curing. Some of them are better than others, but in general, every single one that I've tested, the vacuum heat treatment provides a better surface quality on the cast piece. Now, <clears throat> I want to take these last two slides and just talk about something really quickly. When I'm talking about vacuum, I'm not talking about using the vacuum pump that you've been using for uh, your investment for the past 20 years where the oil is full of water and the machine is ruined from uh, its constant exposure. It works great for mixing your investment. It's not going to work well for this process. What we're looking for in this process where I found the effective range for a vacuum is down at around seven Pascal or uh, 50 microns of mercury. This is basically a laboratory grade vacuum. This is not, uh, not that machine that you've been beating up for uh, 20 years, uh, pumping a lot of water through as you do all your investing. So if you want to try this, you really need to have a good vacuum tight system that can reach these levels of vacuum. And in order to know that you're reaching these levels of vacuum, you're going to need a vacuum gauge that allows you to read those levels of vacuum. So this dial gauge that comes on all of your investing equipment is totally useless for this. You need a good uh, thermistor type gauge. They cost about uh, 200 euros, so they're not horribly expensive, uh, but you do need a good gauge so that you can figure out that you're in the right range for processing the uh, parts. And you also need to have a vacuum oven that's leak tight enough to reach the, these uh, levels of vacuum. So this paper was originally written uh, for the Santa Fe Symposium and uh, the folks there, without their help and support, I never would have been able to put this together. And Without the help and support of my wife, who's uh, come here with me uh, to enjoy your hospitality, uh, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, so thank you very much, Terry. And I would like to thank all of you for inviting me here and sitting through and listening to this. Uh, it's a great honor to have been invited to uh, come and present here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Binion. Allora passo al prossimo relatore e vi invito, se avete piacere di formulare dei domande ai nostri relatori, che si rendono disponibili al termine di questa sessione. Allora, con grande piacere che presento il prossimo relatore, Beatriz Biagi. Designer di gioielli e gemologa, Beatriz Biagi crea collezioni innovative di gioielleria, collaborando come consulente di design per importanti aziende e organizzazioni internazionali come il World Gold Council. Tra le attività da lei svolte ci sono le previsioni dei trend e la realizzazione di trend book in molte nazioni, fra le quali India, Turchia, Messico e paesi arabi. Inoltre Beatriz tiene seminari e conferenze e si occupa di gestione di progetti per diversi programmi di innovazione in Europa, Asia e America. Il titolo della sua memoria è Progettare l'innovazione. 
a 15 anni di distanza dal suo primo intervento al GTF, la dottoressa Biaggi analizza le tendenze emerse nel settore del gioiello e del lusso dall'inizio del millennio che si confermano decisive per lo sviluppo del prodotto e le future strategie di diffusione delle novità. Dando il giusto peso alle mode effimere, ma focalizzandosi sui cambiamenti strutturali, si soffermerà sulla definizione degli strumenti progettuali da attuare perché l'innovazione del gioiello si esprima al meglio delle sue potenzialità. Prego Beatriz. Grazie. 